Well, again, thank you all for being on tonight. Wonderful to see you. Uh, we're going to have a word of prayer and get right into our lesson for tonight. Father God, we love you so much. You're an awesome God. You are great, and you are greatly to be praised. Thank you for keeping us through this week thus far, and even keeping us through this day. Thank you for uh, even giving us a mind to, at the end of the day, to come and to hear a word from the Lord. So, Father, I pray that you would refresh our minds and spirits and bodies so that we can have uh, the proper amount of uh, tension that we need uh, to hear and to receive what it is that you want us to receive. Open our hearts, open our minds. Father, we pray that you would let us open up so that you can pour into us tonight. I pray for every person, every home, every family that's represented tonight. Father, give them what they need as only you can. Father, we pray that you would bless the word and bless the hearers tonight as it goes forth. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, tonight we are going to be uh, teaching on the subject of a time of refreshing, a time of refreshing. And uh, I, I've been led to this particular teaching tonight. Um, I guess I could say I know why. I, I know that it's a needed word. Uh, but it's a lot of needed words, especially in this season. So, uh, but God led us this way. And so we pray that you can get at least one or two nuggets out of this teaching tonight uh, that will help you. I know that as I'm teaching tonight, even some of you now, uh, you're, you're weary, you're tired, uh, you feel burdened down. And so we pray that uh, this evening uh, we'll be able to... Uh, give you some reprieve and some resources to help you as you uh, go through whatever it is that you're going through. So uh, I want to start with Psalm 91 verse 1. Uh, if you know anything about Psalm 91, you know that is uh, full of richness. It's just full of richness. And I'm not going to read the whole thing tonight. I just want to focus on the first verse. I encourage you in your uh, devotional time and in your uh, own time that you would uh, meditate on the entire 91st Psalm. But tonight, I just want to lift up verse one to set the tone for where we're going tonight. And it says, those who live, uh, King James says, dwell in the shelter of the Most High will find rest. Somebody just say rest. Rest in the shadow of the Almighty. Those who live in the shelter of the Most High will find rest in the shadow of the Almighty. The first thing I want to say tonight is that word live, that word dwell, is a word of permanency. It's a word of consistency, uh, which suggests tonight that the presence of God is a place we ought to consistently find ourselves in. And you've got to present yourself to God. Um, you're not going to be in the presence of God just because you wake up. We know that God is omnipresent. But the type of dwelling that we're talking about is intentional on the part of of the one who is in relationship. You've got to avail yourself. You've got to present yourself. You've got to be intentional about being in his presence. You've got to be intentional about staying and remaining in his presence. Uh, whatever you've got to do. And for, for different people, that means different things. Uh, but it's so important that you remain there because that's where you find your rest. That's where you find your refreshing. That's where you find your renewal. Some of you at work, uh, you may have to come up with a creative way to etch out some time in the presence of God. At your home, uh, you've got to intentionally find a way to be with God, to dwell, to live. Not just a casual visitor, you know, we have some family that we visit occasionally, maybe annually. Uh, we go to a family reunion. It can't be like that with the presence of God. You can't be an annual visitor. 
You can't be a biannual visitor. You can't be a monthly visitor. You've got to be there. You've got to remain there. You've got to stay there if you expect to be renewed, to be refreshed, to be revived enough to keep going and not to faint. Amen. Somebody just say, stay there, stay there, stay there, stay there. What are, but what are some of the things that, that weigh us down, that, that dry us up, that cause us uh, to feel as if we're at the brink of collapse, at the point where we can't go any further? I want to uh, talk about several things, and I want to try to give us some, some resources uh, to deal with those things. First of all, if, if my note takers can put this in the notes, the first thing is the weight of life. The weight of life. Um, I'm, I'm doing some alliterations with W's, but you could interchangeably say the cares of life. Just life. Just life. Just, just getting up and watching the news and seeing what's going on uh, with the election and seeing what's going on uh, with the virus and seeing what's going on with the economy, the weight of life itself. And, 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 and all of us are dealing with stuff that never makes the news because nobody knows but you and, and your intimate circle. So, so it, it's not just the public stuff. It's not just the national stuff. It's not just the statewide and city and government stuff. It's your personal stuff. It's, it's what's going on between you and your siblings. It's what's going on between you and your children. It's what's going on between you and your significant other. It's what's going on with the people at your job and, and what they're trying to do and, 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 and all kinds of, uh, it's like a surrounding of issues and you get, you can get in, uh, surrounded and, and enclosed by a myriad of problems, this thing today and that thing tomorrow. And, and life has a way of unexpectedly bringing things to you that you did not anticipate, that you did not plan for, that you were not ready for. And the weight of life can boggle you down, can dry you up, can make you feel like you cannot make it. But I want you to know tonight when the weight of the world and the weight of life gets on you and it's on your shoulders, there is hope. There is hope. There is hope. You can run to the presence of God where you can be refreshed like you can be refreshed in no other place and in no other way. You've got to find a way to live, become a resident of the presence of God. So just the weight of life, things that happen all around us. Then, uh, and I know this ain't popular to talk about in 2020, but then there's the weight of unaddressed sin. The weight of unaddressed sin. Somebody say sin. You probably ain't said sin in a long time. Sin has a way of drying us up, of weighing us down. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1, the New Living Translation. Listen what it says. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a huge crowd of witnesses to the life of faith, let us, check this out, strip off every weight, every weight that slows us down, but here it is, especially the sin that so easily trips us up and let us run with endurance the race that God has set before. So sometimes what is weighing us down is unaddressed sin, sin that we have not asked for forgiveness for, sin that we have not repented of, uh, things we've said to people things we've done to people, uh, secret sins that nobody knows but you, but you are still dealing with the weight, your, your, the Holy Spirit's conviction about what you've done is weighing you down and your conscience is weighing you down because of unaddressed sin. 
1 John chapter 1, verses 8 and 9 in the contemporary English version. It says, if we say, because some of y'all saying, yeah, y'all need, y'all need to, y'all need to deal with that sin. All y'all need to deal, but, but not, it ain't y'all, it's all. Here we go. First John, first, first chapter, verse eight, nine says, if we say that we have not sinned, we are fooling ourselves and the truth isn't in our hearts. But if we confess our sins to God, he can always be trusted to forgive us and take away our sins. Sometimes it's the sin that needs to be taken away. And see, every sin is not of commission. See, you, 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 you ever heard people say sins of omission and commission? Some of the sin is things God told us to do and we didn't do it. Some of the sin is things that we know the word of God instructs us to do and we haven't done it yet. But we know it's right to do. We know it's the thing to do and we haven't done it. And the Holy Spirit is convicting us about it. And so the weight of that sin, that unaddressed, that unrepentant sin, can have a way of impacting all areas of your life and you don't even realize it. Unaddressed sin. So, how can I be refreshed? How can I be renewed when I have to deal with the sin issue? Acts chapter 3, verse 19. Acts chapter 3, verse 19. I'm going to read it from the Amplified. Acts chapter 3, verse 19 says, So repent. Repent means to stop and go the other way. You got to stop first. Okay? You, you, you got to stop first. Then go the other way. Repent. Change your inner self, your old way of thinking. Regret past sins. If you're truly a believer, sin ought to be regrettable to you. I'm not saying you ought to wallow in self-pity. I'm not saying you ought to have a pity party and, and, and engage in self-condemnation. But if I'm truly born again, my sins should be regrettable. I should regret them. I should feel bad about them. I should have a conviction about them. And return to God. Return to God. Listen, I don't care how deep of a hole you've dug as it relates to whatever sin you may have been in. We can return to God. Oh my God. I don't, I don't, that, listen, you can return to God. I don't care if it's been a month, six months, a year, five years, you can return to God. I don't know who that's for. Maybe that's for somebody you know. Maybe that's a word of encouragement that you need to take and carry to somebody else that has been in a bad place, that has been in a sinful place and let them know, I, listen, I get it. I know you feel bad, but you can return to God. It says, seek his purpose for your life so that your sins may be wiped away, blotted out. I'm still in Acts 13, I mean 3 and 19, completely erased so that, here it is, here it is, so that times of refreshing may come from what? From the presence of the Lord. I love this. Watch this. Restoring you like a cool wind on a hot day. Oh my God. That's too good. I got to say that again. It says, repent so that your sins may be wiped away so that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord Restoring you like a cool wind on a hot day. That 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 sounds like refreshing to me. A cool wind on a so, see so, you know what it is to, to to be outside on a hot day and that cool wind hit just right at the right time. God is saying when you repent 
And when you address that sin and when you turn back to God, he said, I have a way of refreshing you in a way that is just like when you were outside burning up and that cool wind came to hit you. He says that I'm not going to let you keep burning up and quit being uncomfortable and all hot and bothered because of what you did. He said, if you'll just ask for forgiveness and repent, he says, I will refresh you in my presence. And I like that. I will refresh you in the presence of the Lord, meaning that he does not kick you out of his presence. He does not ban you from his presence. But he says, if you'll just repent, if you'll just forgive me, you can return to my presence. You still have access to my presence. So there's the weight of life in general. There's the weight of unaddressed sin. But then there's also, some of us are dealing with the weight of being committed to service. The weight of being committed to service. Luke chapter 10, verse 38 through 42. Uh, it's an interesting story uh, with Mary and Martha. I'm going to read it from the Amplified uh, version. It says, now while they're were on their way. Jesus entered a village called Bethany, and a woman named Martha welcomed him into her home. She had a sister named Mary who seated herself at the Lord's feet and was continually listening to his teaching. But Martha was very busy and distracted with all of her serving responsibilities. Did y'all catch that? She was busy and distracted with all of her serving responsibilities. And she approached him, being Jesus, and said, Lord, it ain't bothering you that my sister has left me to do all the serving. Tell her to help me <laughs> and do her part. And I know that's where some of y'all are right now. you like, Lord, you... You ain't concerned that these other people ain't doing their part. Could you tell them to help me, please? <laughs> Could you tell these people to help me? All right. And the Lord replied, but check, check Jesus out. He says, Martha, Martha, you are worried and bothered and anxious about so many things. He said, this probably really ain't even about this. You, you probably worried about a bunch of things. That's manifesting right in this moment. But he said one thing is necessary. For Mary has chosen the good part. That which is to her advantage. Which will not be taken away from her. In other words. The translation of that last couple verses is. Jesus was saying. I know that serving. And doing church work. Is absolutely important. But he says. But don't fault her. For wanting to be in my presence. Because that's where the refreshing happens. That's where the renewal happens. That's where the building back up happens at my feet and in my presence. So here's a question I want to pose based on this uh, passage that we just read. And you've got to answer this. I want you to answer this. You don't have to answer it in the comments, but I do want you to answer it for yourself. Is the bulk of my time spent as a worker for God or as a child with God. It's the bulk of my time spent as a worker for God or as a child with God. Now let me get my disclaimer. Let me because I already know. I already know. Let me get my disclaimer. This is not an out for those looking to escape the charge of being steadfast and abounding in the work of the Lord. Because, as you already know, we are called to be functional and faithful members of the body of Christ. But here's the quandary of the faithful worker. Is that even when that uh, light on that internal fuel gauge comes on and they know they're almost on E, they will keep pushing because they equate never stopping with giving God their best. Even when they, the, the, that light comes on and the, the little thing dings on the inside and lets them know, all right, I'm almost on E. They'll keep pushing anyway because they equate never stopping with giving God their best. But 
They will also keep pushing when they're almost on empty because of the real and justified fear that if they stop to refuel, no one else will step up to keep the work going. Did you hear what I said? So there's the problem of equating never stopping with giving God your best. And there is some, some uh, validity to that. But we just don't want to be radical with that thinking. But they'll also keep going because there's a real and a justified fear that if they stop, who's going to do it? Who's going to pick up the mantle? Who's going to keep it going? And because of these realities, we have people on the verge of burnout and breakdown trying to, in the name of being faithful and committed, they just keep going and going and pushing and pushing and driving and driving when that light has already come on and said, man, I'm on E. I'm on E, but if I stop, who's going to do it? I'm on E, but where are the other workers? So we have people in the name of doing good who are about to be in a bad place because they fear that no one else would do it. All right. So how can we fix this? How can we help this situation? Number one, we must all learn the value of resting and being refreshed when needed. Listen, I'm talking to my, I'm preaching to myself right here. Y'all pray for me. We must all learn the value of resting and being refreshed when needed. Scripture says that God created the world in six days and on the seventh day, he rested and was refreshed. If God himself needed to rest and be refreshed, what more about you and I? There's nothing holy about running yourself into the ground. Because if you run yourself into the ground, you ain't running no more. I just said something. I said, if you, if you run yourself into the ground, God can't get no glory out of that because you ain't running no more. So you've got to stay faithful, stay committed, keep working, but when, when that light on the inside, that internal gas gauge lights up. You got to do something. Now, you ain't supposed to just disappear. But when you need, when you realize your own E, you got to say something. You got to say, listen, pastor, listen, you know my heart. But right now, I'm, I ain't got nothing. I need to refresh. I need to refuel. So is it possible that maybe we can find somebody else for, for just a hot second while I take this time to refuel and renew? But see, it, but it can't be the same people, y'all. It can't, it can't just be the same small pool. It can't just always be the faithful few. That's why in order to give people the opportunity to refresh, and refuel. We all got to be working so that the work doesn't stop just because somebody needs a break. The work doesn't stop just because somebody needs to rest. Amen. I pray this is blessing y'all. Now, so we've got to learn the value of resting and being refreshed, but then we all must commit to helping with the work. That's the second thing. I kind of already addressed that. So I don't need to get into that. Any more than I already have. Learn the value of resting and being refreshed. But then everybody's got to commit. To helping with the work.
Amen. Now, uh, I asked you a question a minute ago. I said, is, is the bulk of your time spent as a worker for God or as a child of God? Um, I'm going to give this illustration. So, um, for years, I, I worked uh, for my dad on his staff as a uh, minister of music, as youth pastor, as executive pastor. And when working in those capacities, you know, I kept it professional because I was being paid to do a job. I didn't even call him dad when I was on the clock or in the work environment. He was always pastor or bishop. He was pastor or bishop. But it was when the work day was over and he would say, Marks, come on, let's go to dinner or come on over to the house with the rest of the family. And, and there we would eat and laugh and share with one another that I transitioned out of my role as the employee and embraced my position as the son. Did y'all hear what I said? I said it was it was when the when the work day was over. When the work day was over, I transitioned out of my role as employee. And I embrace my position as the son. And I'm afraid that too many of us, well-meaning, but we know God as our master, but not nearly enough of us know him as our father. We know him as our master. We know him as our boss. We know him as the one who we're supposed to obey and serve. But not enough of us know him intimately enough as the father. And that right there is when you really appreciate your relationship with the Lord. If all you know God as is a boss and a master, you missing out. On the best part of being in relationship with the Lord. You, get, you got to get to know him as Father God. Father God. When, 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 when the disciples asked Jesus to teach him how to pray. He didn't say you start off by saying our master. He didn't say you start off by saying our boss, the big boss man, the big man upstairs. No, he said, you know how you start off addressing him? Our father. That, ladies and gentlemen, is when you really will start appreciating being in relationship with God. When you relate to him as father. But the only way we come in full circle now. Because remember we started off with Psalm 91 and 1. Telling you that we got to remain as residents of the presence of God. The only way you can really get to know God as father. Is you got to spend some time in his presence. You got to spend some time where he is. You got to live where he lives so that you can get to know him as father. Amen. Um, now, in order to refill, we must maintain the things that feed our souls. Did y'all hear what I said? In order to refill, we must maintain the things that feed our soul. What am I talking about? I'm talking about things like devotional time. Things that feed your soul. I'm talking about things like prayer. Prayer. You got to talk to him. Prayer. Let him talk to you. Prayer. Uh, things like reading and meditating on the word of God. Reading and meditating on the word of God. What does meditating mean? I, I, I tried a couple times early in earlier lessons to help us to understand the original meaning of when the Hebrews talked about 
meditating, it wasn't just like you close your eyes and rock back and forth. But meditating was a continual declaration, a murmuring, continually saying it over and over and over and over until you become one with it, until it gets all in your spirit, until it, it gets so much in you till it starts running out of you. Reading and meditating on the word of God. When you read the word, say it out loud, declare it out loud so that it fills your atmosphere, so that it fills your mind, so that it fills your spirit. Reading and meditating, the things that feed your soul. If you're on empty, you got to put something in. If you're running on empty, you got to put something in you that's going to feed you. If, if you're running out of gas, you got to stop at the gas station. Amen. Personal and corporate worship. Personal and corporate worship. Personal means you and God by yourself. Just worshiping him, giving him glory, honoring him, praising him, adoring him, loving on him. On your own time and by yourself. And then the corporate worship. Personal worship, corporate worship. If you're running on empty, running away from God is the exact opposite of what you should be doing. If you're running on empty, if you're feeling dry, if you're feeling empty, if you're feeling weighted down... You getting a break from the presence of God is the idea of the enemy. God did not tell you to take a break from the presence of God. You might need a break from church work. But you never need a break from the presence of God. That's the place you got to run to. That's the place you're supposed to live. Even if you don't show up for the corporate worship experience, don't take a break from the presence of God. If, you, if you're not in corporate worship, that you ought to be in personal worship. You, you ain't going to get better ever by taking a break from the presence of God. That's a suggestion from the enemy. And he may make it sound logical, and reasonable. But that's a that's that's a deceptive suggestion that is only going to push you further and to dry you more. You may need a, a break from something, but never from the presence of God. Then fellowship with others. Fellowship with others. When you're dry and empty, find you some people who are have life-giving spirits. Find you somebody who's funny. Find you somebody who, if you call them, you know they're going to say something to make you laugh. They're going to say something to make you feel better. Fellowship with others because isolation is also another way for the enemy to have his way with you. Fellowship with somebody. Call your best girlfriend. Call your best friend. Call your cousin, your sister, somebody. Hey, what's up? What you got going on? Tell me something good. Even if you get one laugh and tell you, all right, I got to go. I just needed to laugh. And I knew you'd make me laugh. I knew you'd say something to encourage me. That's why I called you. Thank you. I got to go now. But fellowship with others is important. Now, uh, we're about to wrap up. So here's several things I want to encourage you to do. And, 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 and really want to encourage you to do these things. And, and it wouldn't hurt if you did them on a daily basis. 
Y'all ready? Note takers, here you go. So I need you to regularly assess, even daily, assess where you are. So here's some questions you ought to ask as a part of your assessment. Number one, what are you mad about? That's question number one. If you ain't mad about nothing, move on to question number two. What are you sad about? So you got what are you mad about? What are you sad about? Number three. What are you worried about? What are you anxious about? And then what are you glad about? What are you glad about? What are you glad about? All right. So the assessment is what are you mad about? What are you sad about? What are you worried or anxious about? And then what are you glad about? Once you identify where you are by asking these questions. Thank you. Whoever said you like the blue hat. Bring it all to God. And expect him to refill and renew you. So I've assessed. I've answered my questions. I've identified where I am. And I'm going to take all of that. And I'm going to bring it to God. With the expectation. That I will be refilled. And renewed. Hebrews 4 and 16. New Living Translation. So let us come boldly. To the throne of our gracious God. There we will receive his mercy. And we will find grace to help us when we need it most. Amen. What a blessed privilege and assurance we have to come and bring whatever we have to God. Matthew 11 and verse 28. I pray you're writing these scriptures down. Uh, Matthew 11 and 28 in the NRSV says, come to me. This is the words of Jesus now. Come to me, all ye that are weary and are carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. He says, come to me. Don't run from me. Come on. That's what I'm here for. Come to me. Bring me all your stuff. Bring me what you're mad about. Bring me what you're sad about. Bring me what you're worried about. Even bring me what you're glad about. But come to me. Give me your heavy burdens, and you know what I'm going to give you in exchange for your burdens? I'm going to give you some rest. But that don't happen unless you come to him. That's the deal. You can't Now, you can't create a new deal on your own terms. The terms of the deal are, come to me, and I'll give you rest. That's the deal. But you got to come. You got to come. Hey, Shelly. Um, Psalm 23, verses 1 through the A clause of verse 3. I'm going to read it from the Amplified. The Lord is my shepherd to feed, to guide, and to shield me. I shall not want. He lets me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still and quiet waters. Here we go. Clause A, verse 3. He refreshes and restores my soul. That's wonderful, right? But can I take you back to verse 1? The Lord is my shepherd. Which suggests, ladies and gentlemen, to be a shepherded sheep, you got to be close enough for the shepherd to see you. I keep saying, you can't run from God and expect the good that comes with being in close proximity with God. There are some definite benefits of staying in close proximity with God. You got to stay close to him. Of course you don't feel refreshed and you don't know the last time you were in his presence. Of course you feel weighed down. Of course you feel like you about to lose it. You got to stay in his presence. Listen, it's a struggle sometimes 
when you've been in his presence. So, you got to stay there. You got you got to you got to let the shepherd shepherd you. So don't run away from God. Don't 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 drift off. Stay close enough so that you can be refreshed and restored by the good shepherd. Amen. Psalm 50, 55, rather, verse 22 in the New Living Translation says, Give your burdens to the Lord and he will take care of you. He will not permit the godly to slip and fall. He's going to take care of you. <laughs> give, give him your burdens and he's going to take care of you. Amen. Uh, there's a hymn uh, that I used to hear one of the... Uh, the senior ladies at our church sing by uh, Charles Albert Tinley. Some of you know it is simply called Leave It There. And uh, I just wanted to give you that chorus because I, I think it's a, a beautiful sentiment and a, and a great admonition to the people of God. It says, leave it there. Leave it there. Take your burden to the Lord and leave it there. If you trust and never doubt, he will surely bring you out. Take your burden. Take your weight. Take your frustration. Take your anger. Take your pain. Take your anxiety. Take your disappointments. Take them to the Lord and leave them there. I'm closing, but I want to give a couple scriptures that uh, I'd like us to use as personal and even corporate confessions. Uh, so I pray that you will write these down. Jeremiah chapter 31, verse 25. Jeremiah chapter 31, verse 25. I chose the New International Version, uh, but you can choose whatever version you like. I just like how the New International Version reads. And it says, I, this is the Lord speaking, I will refresh the weary and satisfy the saint. Why is that important to confess? Because sometimes you need to be reminded of what God promised you so you know you have something to hold him to. When you're feeling weary, when you're feeling burdened, when you're feeling like you're running on E, you, you bring Jeremiah 31 and 25 back to the Lord. And you say, now, Lord, you told me, you said in your word, you promised that I will refresh the weary and I will satisfy the faint. You said that. So I, I'm, I'm trusting you to make good on your word. And he will. Because he's a promise keeper. Because he's not a man that he should lie, nor the son of man that he should repent. God will do what he promised to do. Second, second and lastly, Isaiah chapter 40, verses 29 through 31. Isaiah chapter 40, verses 29 through 31. I chose the New King James Version, but again, you can choose whatever version that suits you. And it says, he gives power to the weak. And to those who have no might, he increases strength. Verse 30 says, even the youths shall faint and be weary. And the young men shall utterly fall. But those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. Somebody say renewed strength. Come on, somebody put that in the comments. Renewed strength, renewed strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. I want to lastly say to you, find yourself remaining in the presence of God so that every time you feel weak, burdened, on e that the presence of God can renew and restore you in Jesus' name. I want to pray for you. 
Father, I pray for every person who's viewing, even those who may view the rebroadcast. I thank you right now that you promised us in your word that you will refresh and renew us. Father, we stand on your word. We trust you to do what you said you would do. Father, I pray for weak who is in a place where they're struggling. I pray right now that you would release a fresh anointing, a fresh wind, a new strength, a renewed power. Build them up, Father, in their area of weakness. Cause them to, to rise up as on eagle's wings. Father, I pray that you would minister to them, minister to that need, minister to that hurt, minister to that pain. Father, you know exactly how to do it. You know exactly where it is. You know exactly how long they've been feeling this way. And Father, I just came to thank you that there is hope and that you even now are doing a new work and a fresh work. You're restoring somebody tonight. You're refreshing somebody tonight. Father, you're even restoring somebody the joy of their salvation. Father, give, give them that smile that they, they used to have. Give them the pleasure that they used to have in serving you. Father, I pray that they would trust you with every burden and with every care. And know that you're big enough and God enough to handle it, even if it's too heavy for them. So, Father, we pray your blessing and the peace of God that passes understanding on your people even now. In Jesus' name, amen.